Let's continue with signs and aunt minis of degenerative diseases of the central nervous system. Here are the signs and aunt minis we're going to talk about. And let's start by looking at birds. This is a mid-sagittal T1-weighted image of the brainstem. And if we use our imagination, we can recognize a penguin or a hummingbird in this mid-sagittal view. What does this patient have? Well, there is atrophy of the midbrain, and this atrophic midbrain now looks like the head of either a penguin or a hummingbird seated on a more bulky pons, which is the body of the hummingbird or the penguin. This is a sign classically described, and all neuroradiologists know it, in progressive supranuclear palsy. It's also, in my opinion, one of the most overrated signs in neuroradiology and often incorrectly used because, to be honest, this could also look a bit like a pingming if you use your imagination or if you... Uh, you know, just look at the morphology of the midbrain and the pons, despite the fact that in this case, no macroscopic midbrain atrophy is present. If you look at uh, images in the same patient two years later, even there, we could say it looks a bit like a hummingbird or a pigwin if you want it to be, but also here there is no clear midbrain atrophy, maybe a little bit, but uh, you would easily miss it if nobody asked you to look at the midbrain. Now, three years now another year later now the midbrain has clearly become too small it's clearly atrophic and is also the case on the follow-up mri one year later so if you look at the initial images of 2016 and the final images of 2020 you clearly see a difference and it's only in those last two images that you could use or call this a hummingbird sign or a penguin sign but admittedly it's difficult. So in my experience, the day a radiology resident and training learns about a hummingbird sign is also the day he starts seeing them and reporting them. So you really have to tone it down a bit, their enthusiasm and say, well, you know, you can always recognize it. So when is it truly a penguin sign or a hummingbird sign? Uh, you have to have this. So the head of the midbrain has to be uh, concave. It shouldn't be convex. If you look here, here it's flat. That's still okay. Here it maybe starts to become a bit convex, but isn't quite yet. Here it's clearly convex. So that's where I would start calling it. And that's not enough. Basically, you have to have atrophy of the midbrain, and it's better to evaluate that a bit more quantitatively. And what's yeah, we've seen this. So the hummingbird or the penguin sign, it is characteristic, but not pathognomonic for a progressive supranuclear palsy. It can be almost pathognomonic if the atrophy is very advanced, but then it's better to use quantitative measures. For instance, what is something I do? Let's look at these images once again. Let's use the midbrain to pons ratio. And in a normal situation, your midbrain fits about four times in the pond. So a normal ratio is about 0 0.25. So you could actually measure that, measure that on midbrain sagittal images, or you could just, you know, eyeball it and try to figure out how many times would it fit in there. And when does midbrain atrophy become very specific for progressive supranuclear palsy if your midbrain fits about eight times in your pons. If you can eyeball that or if you measure it and your ratio is smaller than 0 0.125, then it becomes specific. Now, there's a large area in between that is a gray zone because the midbrain can also become atrophic. Uh, you know, due to some age-related atrophy, it can also become atrophic and some other disorders, but not as severe as MPSP. So there's a gray zone. And that's also why like the hummingbird sign or the pigwing sign is not really pathognomonic or not so specific. And it's very
very subjective. So actually, I don't really use it. I always measure it. I always measure the ratio of the midbrain to the pons, and I kind of rely on that. Another sign described in progressive supranuclear palsy is the appearance of the midbrain on axial images. And it is said that due to atrophy, the cerebral peduncles stand out, and now your midbrain looks a bit like Mickey Mouse. So we can see the resemblance, but to be honest with you, every midbrain you look at in the actual plane you can recognize a mickey mouse hat a uh, mickey mouse head uh, in that configuration so don't use it it's overrated it's so subjective that it is completely useless another sign often described in the literature as the morning glory sign also that sign i find very difficult to use so difficult that i decided not to even discuss it another sign that is more easy to recognize uh, and I believe a bit more useful is a so-called hot cross bun sign. It is an atrophy of the pons in which we see a cross and it looks a bit, your atrophic pons with that cross in between looks a bit like a uh, hot cross bun. Uh, as we can see here, it looks tasty, but unfortunately this is a sign of a severe degenerative disorder leading to Parkinsonian symptoms and sometimes also cerebellar and autonomic symptoms. This is the same patient as the initial MRI. The pons is not atrophic yet, but we can see signal changes in the middle cerebellar peduncles. These already reflect degenerations, degeneration rather, of the pontocerebellar fibers, the fibers connecting the brainstem to the cerebellum and in the same patient a couple of years later the pons has become completely atrophic and we can clearly see a hot cross bun sign over here and these are degenerated ponto cerebellar fibers at the center of the brain stem this is the same patient but on sagittal images so the patient initially presented already with some symptoms like gait ataxia unsteady and clumsy walking and on follow-up mri we see clear atrophy of the pons but also of the cerebellum so the hot cross bun sign is a sign of multiple system atrophy uh, disorder in which there are some subtypes and this is the cerebellar subtype it is, however, not 100% pathognomonic because this feature can also be seen in some other quite rare degenerative diseases, like, for instance, hereditary, um, uh, no, it's uh, the genetic ataxias, uh, some of the spinocerebellar ataxias. Um, now, multiple system atrophy tends to occur in older patients. If you see this sign in younger patients, also with signs of cerebellar ataxia, think one of the spinocerebellar ataxia syndromes, more specifically type 2, 3, 7, or 8. This is also um, it, this is a very subtle sign described in a rare disorder. This is the ear of the link sign. So we see these um, areas of signal increase on this flare image next to the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. These look a bit like these fluffy whiskers or hairs on the ears of this uh, magnificent lynx. And this is a sign that can be seen in heredita and, uh, hereditary spastic paraplegia. It's a subtle finding. Also, we frequently see caps along the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. So you should also be careful not to confuse your physiological caps with this sign. Um, it can be a subtle imaging hint of this rare disorder in patients with spastic paraplegia. So if you have a clinical context, so a younger patient with spastic paraplegia, you see this finding, you can consider it a subtle imaging hint, but rarely will this be a pure radiological diagnosis, so rare disorder. This is a sign that is probably better known. We see diffusion restriction in the basal ganglia, but also in the thalamus, and in the thalamus, the area of diffusion restriction looks a bit like a hockey stick. This is called the hockey stick sign, and the same sign can sometimes be limited to the dorsal part of the thalamus, which we call the pulvinar, and when it is limited to this area, we call it the pulvinar sign. 
When you see these abnormalities on diffusion-weighted images, think Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. This patient will often also have diffusion restriction in the basal ganglia and or in the cerebral cortex. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is also a rare disease and patients typically present with a rapidly progressive dementia. This is also a pulvinar sign, but this pulvinar sign is associated with another disease. This is also not a diffusion-weighted sequence, as you see, but a T1-weighted sequence. And we see areas of signal increase laterally, and now dorsally, and the thalamus on both sides. This is also the pulvinar. And this pulvinar sign on T1 is described in a genetic disorder, Fabry disease. Fabry disease is a multi-system genetic disorder, will involve multiple um, organs, can also involve or uh, the kidneys, for instance. And this is also an example of how signs, their importance can vary with time. In 2003, this pulvinar sign was increased or, or described as a pathognomonic imaging sign of Fabry disease. About 15 years later, an article was published in the same journal, the AGNR, redefining the pulvinar sign. And the conclusion is this is select, uh, as a selective uh, sign. This is actually a rare neuroradiological sign of Fabry disease. So it's more a sign that has some historical merits, but uh, is actually not that useful for the diagnosis of Fabry disease. It's also not pathognomonic. Okay, we're almost through with this presentation. Let's talk about congenital disorders.